We live. Oh, no, you're not. Just wait. That's my blind. How do we do this here? Okay, we're so good. It's just taking us a little while, team. Okay. Hello, little ones. How are things? Hey, happy live Sunday night. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. How are you? Hello, hello, hello. Hi, Stacey Rosiel. Oh my gosh, you guys, what a week. Hi, Tanner. What a fucking week. So let's just get to it because I have a few things I need to tell you tonight. Look, I'm very bright on Instagram. Okay. Thanks for joining me tonight, guys. I've been kind of dreading this today, so do my very best to step in to you with all the things. Uh, we are talking grief tonight, and uh, I have a lot of stuff to tell you about that. So uh, I got my wine, and I got Sarah Mossy, a little shot of butter ripple schnapps, because I'm going to end that this evening with butter ripple schnapps, because you should probably not numb when things are hard. Like, you got to feel it, but I feel a little bit like... Sometimes you can just do whatever the fuck you want. Okay, tonight's one of those nights. So, uh, all right, thanks for joining me. My name is Dr. Jody Carrington, and I'm a psychologist. And uh, I wrote a little book. And uh, I am on a mission with my sweet little team who just came back from, most of them just came back from South Carolina with Rachel Hollis uh, on a business conference all weekend. Um, and they're fit to change the world. Can I just tell you, they are out of control right now. I'm a little worried about Marty, uh, who is, uh, I don't know that I've ever seen her this fired up in her life. So I think we're gonna be in big trouble here right away. Um, I don't know what to do about that guy, sorry. That was a little bit bright there, my Instagram friend. Okay, so um, we got lots to talk about. So, yeah, it's been a week. So what has happened in this last week is a couple of things before even I get to tell you about my RIA. Um, we, I was at the Alberta Legislature on uh, Tuesday, and I met with the Minister of Children's Services. And uh, I had a big plan to go in soft and um, just really be gentle with her and talk a little bit about how amazing she is and all those things. And I fucking came out of the gate uh, hot. And... <laughs> Um, basically I think, um, she is lovely by the way, and very engaged and engaging and open to learning many things, which I think is fantastic. And of course, um, anyway, so I just basically said the kids are not the problem and, uh, we need to start hanging on to people who hold them like foster parents and, um, our caseworkers. And uh, I think we need to do that a thousand and fifty times better because I said to her on the front lines, it's fucking awful. And I haven't been on the front lines for at least a year. Uh, and so I felt like that went well. And uh, her assistant, Hannah, was delightful. We gave them both a copy of the book. Marty and I both got to come in in the meeting. And um, they asked if we would like coffee. And I said yes, um, and that I would like Bailey's. And um, I feel like we were kind of a hit in the Alberta legislature. And then the Speaker of the House, who was our local MLA, Mr. Nathan Cooper, uh, was there. And uh, I'm, Marty and I got to meet with him and uh, got a little bit of a tour. And I said to uh, Mr. Cooper that my, uh, my goal would be to meet the minister, the education minister. And he said, yes, ma'am, let's do that. So we went into her office. And uh, I was a bit nervous. And he, uh, she came out of a meeting. And... Um, She's heard me speak before, which I did not know. So that was fantastic. She was very open and exciting to meet. Talked a little bit about how difficult it has been being in this position of the government's uh, position to cut many things. And so I uh, was very excited to talk to her and she's very open to meeting me with me. So I have a few things that I'd like to um, 
a number of things that I'd like to discuss with her. So that's coming up. And we are going to tell you, I did not get my ba Baileys in the Alberta legislature. They were excited that I asked for Baileys, wished that they could have Baileys, but said that that is apparently not um, appropriate at the Alberta legislature, which is why I'm never going into politics, because how the fuck can you do that job without it? But anyway, so as an aside, I digress. Okay, so that was that. And then uh, most of my team, except for Dale, uh, flew to South Carolina uh, for the Rise Business Conference. And uh, whoo, 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 my expectations were sky high for this conference because it was expensive. It was expensive to get there. Uh, I was all in, uh, in investing um, everything I could in getting our team there because I thought that's what really needed to happen. And... Um, um, it blew my doors off and I was only there for a day. The girls stayed. Yeah. Marie Forleo. Um, the girls I think have said like Rachel and Dave were both fantastic, but Tom, um, Brendan Bouchard, Tom Bilyeu, um, if these, if these are any guys that you're interested in, if you're building your own business or running your own company or, uh, building a team, my goodness, they were all just, they brought it. They had so much stuff. Ed Milet, um, Basically, uh, the girl said that um, they just, they were blown away. So I, uh, we have not debriefed about it. They just flew back this afternoon and um, we're going to have a debriefing this week and talk a little bit about um, what they learned and they're all going to do a specific project for our company based on um, what sang to their soul um, during the conference. So I'm super excited to see what they come up with. And um, then um, Marty and I, I think we'll go through it next week because Marty and I will be together next week. So we will go through it together next week. If you want to join us on Sunday, talking a little bit about uh, Rise Business and how we're going to set up some things. So um, my gosh, we will we will be back again um, to the next one, I hope. And um, yeah, it was amazing. So we'll share everything that we can share about everything we've learned uh, for our little team uh, next week on live. So join us then too if you're, if you're free. We're going to be in Prince Edward Island next week. Oh, how do you, how do you think about my eighties hair today? How about that? I feel like I just need a little fucking guitar. Right. Rhea would love that. I could rock out. Okay. All right. Now, uh, on to the next thing is grief. We're talking about grief tonight because it's on my heart and I really am fucking tired about grief. I grief. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of this whole fucking grief process. I am a fan of talking about it. I am not a fan of being in it. I am done with it. And it can fuck right off, as can everybody who sings about sad things or talks about sad things, like anybody on a country music station, anybody who has children, Anybody who eats egg salad, anybody who does anything about it can all fuck off. Because I don't like grief right now. Okay? So, it's done. And here's the other thing about it is, um, okay, we're going to talk a little bit about grief. We're gonna, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my Rhea girl. I know, Carrie, right? Like, fuck you, Josh Groban, when I'm driving. Fuck you, everybody. Like, <laughs> yeah, fuck, fuck, anyway, I, I'm just trying to remember a song that I was listening to when I had to pull over on the side of the highway two, uh, two days ago because I couldn't even see the road, um, and I couldn't get it in my head, so that was, I was not having a stroke, just in case anybody's worried about it. Hi, sister. Uh, anyways, I'm back. So, yes, egg salad was needed after the butter of ripple schnapps. So let me just tell you a little bit about if those of you who don't know what we've been through in the last little bit. Um, one of my uh, dearest friends on the planet uh, was diagnosed with cancer three and a half years ago. Uh, her name was Rhea. Rhea and I lived together. We met 26 years ago uh, in college and um, she is, will always be, probably one of the most amazing people on the planet. And um, so three years ago, she got diagnosed with cancer after she had her second baby. So she had, uh, we're the same age, but she had her baby's late, just like I did. Uh, and Nevi's even um, 
younger than our youngest. And um, right after, soon after Nevi was born, she found out that she had cancer. And um, it started out as colorectal cancer, stage four, we now know. And um, so did lots of treatment and we thought we had, they thought they had kicked cancer's ass because she just really didn't, um, yeah, thank you, Trace. I might need to call Erin for more one. Um, she uh, she was amazing, and um, and I'll tell you a little story about the middle process. So we we had a deal. Uh, her husband, uh, who's a who is a phenomenal man. I'll speak about him a couple of times. But um, when we lived together in college, um, I met a bunch of her friends who she'd grown up with, and they became uh, my friends. And I knew how much they that uh, Ria loved them. Um, and, um, we just did a lot together over the last 26 years. Um, and she ended up getting married to, um, Sean, who was also from their hometown and, um, they had their two babies. And of course our lives went in many different ways at various times. And so we came in and out of touch in the last three years. Um, of course, cancer has this fucking interesting, beautiful way of bringing everybody together. And um, so I got to know Sean and her babies in a way that I probably would have never without cancer. Um, and uh, I also got to know some of her best friends who she was in, you know, very different circles with, who um, are some of the most phenomenal people on the planet. And so um, when um, she survived her first round of cancer. We decided that three of us who went to college together, Leah and Tannis, both of my best friends, uh, and Rhea, we were going to go uh, away and celebrate um, this whole kick in cancer's ass. So we did. And uh, it was one of the best trips, I think, of my life. But two days before we went, we found out that her numbers were up again, which meant that her cancer was back. And um, we knew it. And I was very mad at Jesus and Buddha and Yahweh and the universe and everybody on the planet that uh, we didn't even get a reprieve to celebrate and um, do all these amazing things with this baby girl. And um, as the universe often does, it was perfect timing uh, because we had five days as a group of four to sink into some of the hardest conversations I've had in my life about grief and mourning and about what it means to be brave. And um, I remember uh, I told this story because I was, uh, it was my honor to pay a, a tribute to Rhea at the funeral two days ago. And um, it was her celebration of life. But, um, and it was a fucking celebration, let me tell you. If, if every funeral could be like that one, um, I promise you everybody would go to every single one. It was, it was one of the best nights of my life. And I don't know that I would ever say that about celebration of life. But anyway, um, the whole theme of the night um, was being brave. And um, I told this little story because when we were in Seattle, uh, having this girl's trip away, we talked about what brave means. And of course, the, the definition of brave is doing something where you can't predict the outcome. So I said to Rhea, I think you are one of the bravest people I know. And she said, like, she got mad at me and said, like, I'm not brave. Like, I didn't choose cancer. It chose me. I just have to fucking deal with it. And, um, and I said, oh, no, 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 my girl. Like, do you understand the definition of brave? The definition of brave is when you um, do something head on, full in, 100% wide open, hair back, when you do not know the outcome. When you can't predict it, that's what brave is. And if you know how it's going to end, it's not brave, right? Like if you – that right? So you could shy away from this. You could uh, completely just sort of even sink away from your kids, prepare for a departure, um, cut off from your husband, um, you know, all of those things that I think um, it would be probably the easiest to do because that's what we do when hard things come, right? We armor up. And I said to her, the, things, the thing that has impressed me the most about you in this process is that you haven't armored up and you have loved your kids uh, full on. You have stepped into hard conversations, hard conversations with your husband when you could have just been like, you know what? Now's not the time. You um, have worked really hard in relationships with your friends and your, your, your parents and, you know, all of these things where you could have just said, we, we don't need to. And um, I said, but you didn't do that. And that's the definition of brave. And nobody's ever taught me. I, I never understood bravery until I've seen you do this. And um, 
And she said, Jody, I'm not always brave. Like you, you don't see Sean and I crying on the bathroom floor. You don't see me sobbing when my babies fall asleep. You don't see all of these things. And I said, oh, my girl, like I, I understand that you're not always brave. But what you're teaching me is that in all ways, whenever possible, to the best that you can, you be brave. And that is, um, we started talking about it, like, how can we be a group of friends uh, and be brave always? in all ways that we possibly can? How can we lean into each other in hard times? How can we have hard conversations? How can we, um, even if it's cancer, even if we have to bury our kids, how can we do these things where to the best of our capacity, we'd be brave? And so the rest of that day, um, we, <laughs> we were in this house because of course she kicked cancer and, um, so I rented this house on the ocean in Seattle and it's, it was um, probably outside of a budget that Aaron, if Aaron knew would like kick my ass, but I was like, fuck it. Like, let's go Dave Hollis. And uh, um, Aaron, can you bring me some more wine? It, it's on the counter. Thank you. What was I thinking? Anyway, so, um, <laughs> uh, anyway, so we, I thought we would just travel all over, uh, the island, uh, on, across from Seattle. We did not. We sat at the kitchen table and talked about, um, what, um, being brave. I'm just doing dishes. So. Oh my God. You look so great in your yep. white undershirt. Thank you. Remember okay. The bowl that I used once free. Yeah. The limousine bull that he judged in Edmonton won supreme. He would just like you to know that because now probably you will be better in all ways because of that. Okay. And I only got a half a glass. Come on. Okay. Anyway, so. When we sat at the kitchen table, basically what we said is, uh, this live, by the way, uh, is not gonna be 20 minutes or a half an hour. So anyway, okay. Uh, it, okay, so we decided that, you know, the, this whole concept of being brave in all ways um, was something that we really needed to make a part of our lives. And so we sketched out this thing and we said, you know what, I think we should all get a tattoo. I think it should say brave always. And so when we came back from that trip, uh, she made us all sweaters. I made them all signs and then we have it in our house. I'll show it to you. It's, I'll take a picture of it and post it tomorrow. But, um, and so we decided someday soon we're going to get it. Like that's the plan next time we come here. And uh, so she came, we came back and in case, um, like the deal is, uh, we found out very shortly after that, of course, it was back uh, in her lymph, lymph nodes and in her lungs and in her liver. And um, uh, it started to metastasize after that in various ways over the last couple of years and um, very painful for her. And um, most of which I don't think any of us knew to the, to the degree that it was, because when I look back at her text now, I see a lot of words about pain, those things I did not read at the time. I read all the, the things, or I saw the things that she would send me that where she was doing great. And um, I, anyway, I, that's one of the things that is always on my head now in this fucked up grief, grief process that I didn't pay close enough attention to that for her. But, um, Anyway, so um, so um, the last little bit for her was really tough, and um, I watched uh, her husband and her kids do some incredible things. I um, I watched some of her friends um, be some of the bravest humans on the planet. I don't. Um, understand how um, you can be with somebody who you love so much every single second of the day. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about, um, oh yeah, so then she she went on to get the tattoo. We decided we're going to do this again together. Someday we're going to come back, we're going to do this this tattoo together. And she sent all of us, Tannis and Lee and I, a text one day just saying, um, look what I did today. 
and no consultation, no discussion, no like, hey, how about we do this? She just fucking got the tattoo. She came home from a doctor's appointment. Her father-in-law, who she adores, uh, Papa Ray, uh, she just asked him if he would swing by the tattoo parlor, and she got the tattoo, and uh, she sent us all a message saying, look what I got. And um, so that is uh, Brave Always is now, uh, as I talked about to her friends and family the other day, uh, her legacy for me. And I will speak about um, Brave Always on every stage around this planet, if I can help it. Um, that will be my gift uh, to her. We've just, I think I told you this last week, but designed a, um, a shirt with uh, the words on the sleeve where she had her uh, tattoo uh, that says Brave Always, um, just to um, start to really lean into this idea that if you are about, to, if you're fixing to do hard things, uh, you won't always be brave, but as long as you show up brave in all ways to the best that you can, um, that's all we need. And uh, gosh, she, she just, she did that so beautifully. And so um, I think that uh, there's three things that um, I want to just share with you about this process that has become clear to me. Um, and I, I've talked about it here before. I talk about it in kids these days, but I think this is the biggest concern, not the concern, sorry, the biggest learning for me. Alan Wolfelt is a grief sort of expert, um, not sort of, he is, he's amazing and um, has shared um, this, the difference between grief and mourning to me. Uh, yeah, Chrissy, we will get the tattoo. Uh, Tannis and Lee and I, uh, Lee is very nervous about it, but we will find a very medically safe tattoo artist. And um, I think many people are going to do that anyways. We, we plan to do that on our birthday next year. So um, the um, the deal is um, that, oh shit, I was going to bring that too. Um, for me, the biggest difference is that um, understanding grief versus mourning. And I often tell you this um, about grief and mourning. Grief is the universal process of loss. If you've heard me speak before on this topic, this is the one thing that I drive home all the time. Grief is the universal process of loss. It is the kick you in the gut, heart-wrenching thing. It's when I hear a song, the James Butler Trio, Forever Now, will stop me in my tracks. When I hear God Bless Texas, I remember her in a bar. <laughs> in college and I can't breathe <laughs> when that happens and um, that's grief because um, you know you won't get that again and um, that comes with all the anger and the missing and the wishing um, that um, that I would have drove through a snowstorm last Christmas to see her. I wish that I would have changed my speaking schedule so I could have been with her um, at the death race this year. I wish um, I knew her friends better. I watch um, people at her celebration of life speak about her and many things that I never knew about. And um, that makes me so mad. And when they talk about anger and grief, I really didn't understand it because I thought that that meant that you were mad at them. And for me, I'm starting to understand a little bit about anger and grief is really like I'm mad at me in this process. I'm not mad at her. And maybe you get mad at them sometimes for leaving or doing those things. But I, I'm really mad at um, me for not serving her better in some of those ways. And I, I mean, I... I appreciate all day long that you do the best you can and you know Aaron and I talk about this all the time and you know I like there's nobody that uh, you know we don't need anybody to fix that process you know you did great like no, mm -mm, mm -mm. that the anger part is really that piece of just like you know anyway Kessler talks about all of these stages of grief and I didn't really get anger but I'm fucking mad sometimes now where you know why didn't I or how did I miss so much time or um how come I don't know, uh, you know, that side of her or how come I can't, you know, all those kind of things. So anyway, the grief is that, that's that. And mourning is how you heal. And mourning is, um, uh, mourning actually feels good. And it's it usually is laughter. It usually is telling stories about her. She, um, 
was so funny and probably like I would watch her sometimes like when we would be um <laughs> out together and she was always the life of the party and she would always dress up in silly things and um music was her love we talked a lot about her uh love of music and in her celebration of life um and she would always be the last person on a dance floor she would always be um it, it just sort of always getting people involved anyway and so it was in those stories that I think are amazing. And, you know, um, what was phenomenal at her celebration of life, uh, her husband was very committed to making this day something that she would be super proud of. And, uh, fuck, I didn't think I was going to cry at all. Like, this is fucking bad. Anyway. Uh, and it was amazing because he, married to her for 18 years minus a day, uh, got up and gave her eulogy and did it absolutely beautifully. Her babies were there in the front row. Our babies were there in the front row because um, that is how you mourn. You are not born with the capacity to mourn. All of her best friend's children were gathered around. Her nieces and nephews were there. Her, her nephew, who is 12, almost 13 years old, got up and spoke about his auntie. Um, it was just um, the most amazing day. And... Um, I, what I love the most about it, right, is that um, how I, and I often said this to, to Sean and you know her two best friends uh, in the whole planet, Irene and Jen, just how she died at home and uh, the children were there. Uh, Shawnee was there, and um, they just her mom and dad spent so much time in her space with her. Um, it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life, and. Um, it, it it really just taught me, right, that death ends a life, not a relationship. And I think the difference between grief and mourning is remarkable, that grief is this process where it hurts like a motherfucker, and then mourning is the laughter. If you would have been, uh, if you would have walked into that hall on um, Friday night, um, you wouldn't have known the difference between it being uh, a celebration of life or their wedding because there was dancing and music and uh, eggs, the egg salad sandwiches might've given it away. Cause I don't, you typically don't have egg salad. It wasn't open face. So there wasn't like a huge indicator. Mm. Because as you know, egg salad is a universal sign of death. Um, but um, so we did have egg salad, which I thought was so good. But grief and mourning, those are the two different things. And I think that uh, I'm just so proud of the people who loved her the most um, about how they were able to come together and mourn. And some people I hadn't seen for many years who knew her in many different capacities taught me about how to do that that day. And um, yeah, it was a gift. I just, I cannot even tell you. So um, I think that uh, was the most critical piece. And, and here's the thing, you don't know how to mourn. You're not born with the capacity to mourn. You're only born with the capacity to grieve. And so um, what I was so thankful about is um, that uh, our, my children uh, didn't, don't know how to mourn. Um, their grandparents, their four grandparents are alive. They're, they have three great grandparents who are alive. And so they'd never really seen me or Aaron sob over anybody. In my first indication, my first inclination, sorry, was to protect them and to not tell them about those things, to not let them see me cry. And um, the when we knew that Rhea was dying, um, I have to tell you the story real quick because I've told it on a couple of different stages, but um, Rhea was uh, doing well, as well as she could be. And then um, kind of within 48 hours, um, just kind of took a massive turn to the, for the worse. And I was talking to, to one of her best friends on the planet, Carrie, and she just said, you know, I don't think we have much time. And so it was um, Saturday, I think, probably, yeah, four weeks ago today. What day is it today? Sunday? Four weeks ago yesterday. Um, we, Tannis and Lee and I decided that, you know, we would go see her and say our goodbyes and her husband was just very, um, so great at having people do that and be around her. And so when we went, um, I, Aaron said to me, um, I want you to go by yourself. Like you just take this day, you stay as long as you need to. 
um, you know, you just hang out with their babies and Sean and, you know, whoever else is there in the day. And so of course we bring, you know, lots of stuff. That's what you do. You bring stuff. And, um, and, uh, I woke up in the middle of the night and I thought, um, at 4am and I thought, uh, uh, he has to come like he, he has to walk we're all just here walking each other home. Like we got to show our babies how to do this. I got to have Luke and Neva and her, um, Rhea and Sean's children. Uh, this is what you do. You bring your children to be a part of this process. And so I woke Aaron up at 4 a.m., which is really fucking helpful. I'll just tell you that's a little tip for free there. Super helpful. And, um, basically I said to him, like you're, you, you and the kids have to come, uh, with me in the morning and, um, we have to go to Sean and Rhea's together. And he was like, he, this is what he said. Fuck. Joel. And I was like, he said, Asher has hockey. And I was like, well, I know, right. Adam C. Woo. Can't miss that. Can we? He's like, oh no, like Asher's going to cry. And he's right. Asher, uh, struggled significantly par partially, I think because it, this was so difficult for me, but also because, um, he doesn't know what you do when somebody dies. He doesn't know how you make sense of that. And so he was very, uh, emotional about this. And anytime he gets upset, his brother gets upset. And then his sister has to turn it up 8,000 times higher because anyway, that's another life. But anyway, so all the three of them were not good the night before. So Aaron said to me, I can't, we can't bring, like, I do not want them to be crying. I do not want them to be losing their minds. I mean, it, I don't want them to scare uh, Nevin and Lucan. Like if they're sobbing, like, is Nevin and Lucan going to think that they're not maybe doing this right? And what if they upset Sean? And I was like, right? All of those things we got to figure out. All of those things we got to walk them home through. And he's like, but don't you want just to focus on Rhea and, you know, Sean and Tannis and Carrie and Jen and Irene? And I was like, yeah, I do. Like, I really do. But this is our job. We got to show him how to do it. And he was like, is this one of those fucking connection things? Yeah, it's one of those fucking connection things, dude. Get in the car. So we drove. And uh, we went, and it was one of the hardest. It, uh, Libby had a meltdown on the way in, and I was like, this is what I was saying to her. This is not the time. I do not have any time for your emotional, whatever I was calling her. I was telling her she was having a lip flip, which was really helpful. And I was like, you pull it together. And so Aaron's like, get back to the car. Like, it's like it was supposed to be this beautiful, like, this is how you mourn bullshit awful so anyway she lost her fucking mind but anyway got that together we got in the house and asher said to me at some point like um mom this was fun he said i'm so surprised but this was a fun day i love to laugh with lucan and did you know that nevi you know was showing me all of her dolls and it was a fun day and i was like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's it that was enough right uh so I was very thankful that that, you know, Sean was just so open and welcoming to that whole process. And so, yeah, so that was that. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was phenomenal. Her, uh, two best friends, of course, were there. Um, they wouldn't leave her side. I was in Regina the day she died and I got to talk to her that morning because Irene, uh, one of her best friends, uh, ever was so intuitive and so smart and, um, asked if I wanted to talk to her that morning and we played a song that um, she couldn't speak at that point, but um, she heard my voice and heard the music and responded to that process, which was uh, probably one of the best parts for me, just so that she knew. Anyway, um, I think that um, I have talked a long time about grief. Um, but I didn't, I knew this, but I don't think I knew this to this degree that, um, that it can physically hurt to this degree. Like I didn't really quite understand that process till now. Uh, and I'm sure that, um, I'm sure that many of you understand this way better than I do, but it is, um, I think the necessity of leaning in. 
that is the hardest thing to do. And um, I, you know, I said to her girl so many times that night that I, I don't know now, I don't know. I don't know how you um, do this now. Like, what if she's the glue? What if we don't um, do, what if I don't do right by her? What if we don't stay connected? All of those things. And um, I, I think that's just the point, right? It is the leaning in. It is giving um, light to all of those worries. It is having those hard conversations about like, you know, I'm sorry I didn't do this or um, I can't wait for us to do that or what do you think we should do um, for her the next time? Uh, how can we make plans about how to stay connected? I think all of those things are um, so incredibly important and you can't, you can't just do that in grief. Grief doesn't allow you to do those things. Mourning does. Mourning allows you to have, um, you know, those funny conversations and to really watch, uh, you know, her mom and dad just, um, you know, in, engage and be a part of all of her friends. And, you know, one one minute, you know, we're in the fetal position, holding each other, bawling by the dance floor, watching some slideshow of Rhea doing some stupid fucking thing. And then, you know, the next minute we're two-stepping and talking about, um, I don't know, what we're going to do next week. Like, I think... Uh, I think that's just how fucked up this process is. And here's the thing, like, this is universal. Like, did you know that? Like, this is the part that I just can't wrap my head around. Like, everybody on the planet, if you've loved, you have the capacity to feel this. And I, that blows me away. And any, at any given moment right now, you play two roles. You are the grievee and the griever, which means if there's any uh, motivation to get out of this fucking grief spot, it is because so many people who you love right now need you to connect over somebody who they're painfully losing. And what we do is we armor up. We stop staying, saying their names. We stop telling their stories. We stop checking into saying, you know what I was thinking of your mom today? Or you know what I was thinking of your baby girl today? Or um, I remember the day Jillian was born. Or uh, I mean, I, and this is what I said to, you know, her, her group. I mean, there was over 500 people in that room on Friday. And, you know, I, I said, I, I hope we never stop saying her name. I don't want her children to ever feel like they can't say mom would have loved this or did mom like that or, um, you know, that whole process. And I think that you, we set the tone as the big people, uh, in, in, in particularly in the lives of little people about the difference between grief and mourning. Right. And so how you do that really matters. And so I think sometimes, um, it, this is a question that I would really encourage you all to ask if somebody ever tells you that they, um, that they um, are missing um, somebody. They've lost somebody. I always want you to say this um, because they, we never do this. You always say, what was their name? And I've done that a thousand times, not knowing just how powerful that is because when, um, like even when I was flying home on Friday morning, I left North Carolina at two in the morning and uh, I was bawling at the fucking front desk of the Ramada in, in Charleston. <laughs> and the poor little like night lady was like, okay, okay. I know it's very sad. She thought I was sad because I was leaving Marty and Tara and uh, Stacy and Dennis. And they were like, oh, I know what she said. It's hard to leave your friends. And I was like, no, it's hard to leave my friends. I said, but I'm, I'm, I'm going home for a funeral today. She said, oh. I'm so sorry. And she didn't shy away from it. Like this woman was amazing. And she said to me, what was her name? And in that moment, I was like, so thankful for every time that I had ever said, what was their name? Because I could not wait to tell her. And um, so ask that all the time. And I think though, there's some times where even in the last week, I was hopeful that nobody would. There were certain times where I was like, don't look at me. Don't say it. I can't. I got to hold it together for a second. But that was maybe 9% of the time, 5% of the time, the other 95. Um, right? I was just hopeful that somebody would want to talk about her or 
ask about her or, um, you know, like those things. So um, I think we're always fearful that we are going to make somebody sad uh, when you ask about their child who's no longer on this planet or their their mom or their dad or, you know, whoever. Uh, but I think that's, that's not for you to decide. And um, I think it's a risk that you should try to take every single time um, because I think that we err always, always on the side of caution. And I think it's a big fucking mistake. So that, uh, yes. Okay. So a couple of things, uh, what I, anyways, I'll leave you with this. Um, you're wired to do it no matter what you have on your plate right now. Each single, every single one of you, all 367 people watching in this moment, uh, have, uh, lost somebody. And um, everybody is in a state of grief and everybody is in a state of mourning. And so you can think about it egocentonically and all of the people that you've lost, but also know that everybody who is in our community, uh, in your family, in your school, in your place of work also has felt that. And uh, they just need you to lean in. So don't ever forget that you also have the power to be on the other side of that. And, um, you know, I like what is busting me um, apart is, you know, when I see um, all the people who I know love her um, as much or more than I did. And sometimes it doesn't feel like you have the right to be sad or you have the right to sort of step in. But I think as um, the grievee, the one who's supporting those, I think sometimes don't underestimate your power of setting that space, holding that space, and being brave enough to hold that space um, is really sometimes our most important role in this whole process. Okay, so also a couple more things. Um, uh, this is kind of like the, the shitty part about it. It, uh, it never ends. You will never, ever get over it. I will never, ever get over this. And, um, I think if you come out of the gate knowing that, um, it, I don't know if it, I, I think it's daunting. And in the first months after some, you lose somebody, but I think we should be honest about this right now. You'll never fucking get over it. Don't try. Right. Like there won't be a day where you will like, woo. Kick that in the ass. Good. Got that done. No. Death ends a life, not a relationship. You're not just going to get amnestic over the fact that she was your best friend or your wife or your... Uh, God, where's my husband when I need him? Just a second. <laughs> I should have been more fucking prepared. You're not supposed to fucking ball through this. Anyway... And I have butter ripple shops. Anyway, so uh, you won't get over it, okay? So um, I think that it's different. The intensity and frequency will decrease. And uh, sometimes we're scared about that, and it happens in a different time for different people, which means the intensity and the, and the frequency of these the grief waves um, will decrease because you have, uh, so you will think the things and feel the feels and do all those kind of things. I think if you deny any of those things, your body says, fuck you, you need to feel those things. And so it'll kick your ass in the worst, <laughs> in the most inopportune times. Okay. So I think you will never get over it. And I think that, um, if you think about that as a welcome uh, testament, um, because I said this uh, on, on Friday, is that um, there is no grief where there is no love. And so if this amount of grief bullshit is any testament to how much I loved her, she's so lucky um, because, like, this is how crazy this is. Like, I, I did not see this coming. <laughs> she was sick for three years, but I did not think for one second, maybe one second, but not one second that it was going to be this hard. Not one time. Because uh, I talk about this all the time. I know. 
I know the difference between grief and mourning. I'll fucking tell you. You want to know something about grief and mourning? Just ask me. I'll tell you. I know what you're supposed to do. I know you're supposed to feel it. I know you're supposed to talk about it. I know you're supposed to um, do a lot of the mourning process. Um, but, but here's also the point, I think, is that grief is also a necessary part of it. And that um, the more you lean into grief, the, the crying, the listening to music, the looking. Even I saw her handwriting today and I was like, huh. That's the part you got to do. And then I think the biggest issue is really um, then how much you talk about it, how much you share about it, how much you lean into those things and understand that the intensity and the frequency will decrease the more you do that. Okay, so the more you lean into grief, the intensity and grief, uh, frequency of it uh, decreases. And then I think that there's certain times where um, that comes back, it's a wave right? And so many people talk about it in waves. And I really love that because mm, I think that's, that's the deal. It's a wave, right? Do you understand? Like there's sometimes where you can't even breathe and then there's other times where, well, so anyway, intensity and uh, and then, uh, yeah. So a couple of things, um, I'll just leave you this with now cause I see we're 46 minutes into this guy. So, um, uh, two resources for kids uh, or for um, you. If you haven't read uh, Ram Dass's We're All Just Walking Each Other Home, very good read. I got it on Audible. Uh, it's very um, philosophical, um, but I, I'm finding a lot of solace in it, just really talking about from like an Eastern philosophy perspective, how the importance of leaning into it. So if you want to uh, take a look at that, and then if you have a baby, uh, baby, if you have a child um, who is struggling, um, the string book, um, I will put up the, honey, there's this, where's the, the kid's book about the string that we just read to the, the kids? Do you see it out there? I'm going to find it. Do you know? Does anybody, can you tell me? Um, the baby's had it. Oh, whoops. Um, we got it for Sean's kids. I didn't, somebody else got it for Sean's kids and then uh, Sean and Maria's kids. And then I bought it for our kids. And uh, it is amazing. The Invisible Strength. Thank you, Cynthia. The Invisible Strength. Thank you, Jen. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so those two things right now are, are really big in my world. I'm sure there's a thousand more. Thank you, Invisible Strength. Yes, Colette. Um, uh, also, uh, my sweet Lori McIntosh bought me a couple of books about love and empathy. Um, I saw them at Costco actually yesterday or this week, and so I bought Nevi and Luke and one of them too. It's really about how we stay connected through love and how we help each other through with um, – um, just being in empathy. And so Asher uh, asked me to read that a couple of times, um, you know, in the first couple of uh, days after Rhea passed away. And uh, it, I find that um, if you can read to your kids in this process, it's a little bit easier than having to sort of have conversations because it evokes that process of like, okay, what does it mean when? So um, I think um, those ones, uh, you know, it's, it's always for the grief of love. Yeah. So just watch guys in the comments, either on Facebook or Instagram, there's, there's a lot tear soup. Um, there's lots of resources because, um, so many of you know about this process so intimately. Um, and, um, yeah, there's no sort of process, uh, in this way that really explains exactly how you're supposed to do this. But, um, there's a lot of fucking ways. Hey, and we're all just walking each other home. That's the Ram Dass quote that I can't forget. And then the other one is the Mitch album, um, death into life, not a relationship. And, um, so no matter what, she will always be your mom. She will always be your, your best friend. He will always be your son. He will always be, um, you know, your niece or your grandson. Um, and, nobody takes that away. And so when her birthday comes or when his, when it's father's day or yes, option B is very, very good. If you've lost a spouse, um, uh, nobody takes that away. And so I, I have to say this to educators, you know, if you have a baby in your class, but by the way, 25% of all kids will lose a parent before the age of 18, one in four. 
And so the statistics around this are huge and we don't fucking talk about it. Like I can't even deal. And maybe it's just because I haven't been in this space very much, but like, wow, we got to do a better, a better job. Okay. So Patrice Karst wrote the invisible spring string. Thank you, Jill. And, uh, so lit, um, Mitch album, uh, is, uh, Tuesdays with Maury, uh, is phenomenal. Uh, death ends a life, not a relationship. So um, what I think is really critical about that is that, um, you know, if you're an educator and you, you know, are teaching a baby who's lost a grandparent or a parent, uh, Mother's Day comes, you make a Mother's Day card because they'll always have a mama. And um, their birthday, they're, they're always your child. If you have four children and you lost a child, you always have four children, right? Like, I think we, we really struggle to sort of understand uh, how we talk about that process and that's okay because there is no fucking script on this process you don't you can do whatever way you want to make it make it for you but um anyway that's that's my story tonight my friends um that borgia ria that borgia i drank um probably a 26 no i did not Anyway, I don't, I feel like probably Facebook's going to shut this down if I talk about that, but we drank a lot of butter ripple schnapps on Friday, my friends, didn't we? And, uh, it was perfect. And so I just needed one more. So I love you too, Carrie. Cheers. And, uh, thanks for listening to me about this girl because, um, Her legacy, I hope, is going to change a whole lot for people in this universal process. And so I'm very excited that I get to um, talk about her for the rest of my days. And I told her that when I see her on the other side, uh, she will need to have some butter ripple waiting because um, I will have a lot of brave stories to tell her. So be brave and talk about this stuff because um, we're all doing it. And um, I will see you again next week in um, PEI, because we're in PEI. We're going to do a big day with first responders and trauma and grief that day. And um, Marty and I will uh, come to you and talk a little bit more about this stuff. So uh, I will, um, I know now I kind of don't want to leave you. Um, but I will be uh, connected again next week. I think we'll go eight mountain, but I'll be very clear about what time that is because I think that means it's like 11 PI, but I'm very sure we'll be up. So, okay. Good night, my friends. Thanks for being amazing.